Few cities have as much history as Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland. The city is located on the Firth of Forth and is the setting for several legends about underground tunnels and alleyways polluted by the most repulsive elements of society that are left to suffer in poverty like a destitute dog. Today we'll talk about one particular close in Edinburgh that is so ingrained in its history that you'd be pressed to find someone who doesn't know of it. Let us talk about the Mary King's Close. The close itself is located in the shadow of St Giles Cathedral on Market Square in the centre of the Royal Mile. St Giles Cathedral, for those who don't know, was one of Scotland's most important churches during the medieval kingdom period. Edinburgh itself is built upon the spine of a rock, with the top of the rock holding the Edinburgh Castle, while the bottom connects to Holyrood Palace. The 1.1 mile, which isn't exactly a mile, it's known as a Scots mile, was connect the two royal households. Nevertheless, much of the city was made up of wines and closes, which spiderwebbed off the sides of the Royal Mile. This is where Mary King's Close was located. A close is normally named after whatever business or famous person happened to live there. Some examples of famous closes within Edinburgh at the time included Allen's Close. We don't know where it derived from, but it was previously known as Leeches, Dowgallus's, Dunlop's and Abernathy's Close. Pearson's Close, named after Alexander Pearson, a 17th century merchant. Craig's Close, named after John Craig, previously Denistons, Burns and Kants. Stuart Close, probably named after William Stuart, a merchant, a Burgess, and a resident of the Close in 1710. And finally, Mary King's Close, which was named after Mary King, a rather notable businesswoman, Burgess, and well, we'll find out. Mary was born towards the end of the 16th century, and in 1616 she would marry a local merchant Burgess, Thomas Nemo, or Nemo as is recorded in the birth records, and together they had approximately four children from what we know, Alexander, Euphame, Jonnet and William. Sadly, Thomas died in 1629, leaving Mary to cope alone with four children and a business to run. At this time, she was living in what is known as Alexander's Close, named after Alexander King, of no relation but a prominent lawyer within the city. As listed from the records of Mary's dwellings in the Close, a stretch of wasteland next to the accommodation was property of Alexander King or his heirs. As we now know, Adam King was the heir but there is no record of himself actually living within the Close. From the records, again, the king's house mails, which were something like a tax, we know that Mary rented a turnpike house near the top of the king's close. A woman on her own had to work hard to support her children. We don't know the exact conditions of her living or how much money she held, but we can tell from her last will and testament in 1644 that she lived somewhat comfortably off her husband's will, given the title as well as the involvement of gold and silver items in her uh, will. Now, we must consider that a woman to have such luxury and also to support herself independently whilst raising four kids during this time is quite a rare thing indeed. Moreover, the title of her husband would give to her, well, the right to vote, which again was extremely rare in this period. As closes were only named after important figures, you can tell that she was somewhat popular and quite important within the city. Little is known about her children, though with further research we may hope to uncover more. Her will and testament leaves the following to her children in 1644. Two gold rings, six silver spoons, a wooden bench, three buffet stools, two pairs of tongs, a variety of fire irons, two tin chamber pots, wine and beer, ten spools of ornate sewing, fourteen pairs of sheets, over sixty cushions and pillows, four plates, six ruffs and nine dozen table napkins. You may talk about your lances or your Irish fusiliers, the Aberdeen militias are the Queen's own volunteers. Now Mary was not the only famous Mary who happened to inhabit the close during its existence. Upon the site, as in above, lays the city chambers, who are home to the Lord Provost of Edinburgh. This is because in Scotland, the title of Mayor doesn't exist, and instead the title of Lord Provost takes its place. However, when Mary Queen of Scots is eventually deposed by her people and various men surrounding her who desire more power, through the use of manipulation, she stays at the Lord Provost Simon Preston of Craig Miller's house in the close. Little does she know, 
this is the last night that she will be Queen of Scotland. In the morning, she would be taken to Dunbar to flee angry mobs of civilians and threat of execution, where she would stay for a year under house arrest. Eventually, she'd make her way down to England to stay with her sister, Queen Elizabeth I, where she would be imprisoned for a further 19 years, and given the Tudor's fondness for the axe, and the religious divide between the two, Elizabeth would eventually have Mary executed by decapitation on the 8th of February 1587. This would leave the Scottish throne vacant until her son James VI and I of England would unite the crown of Scotland and England after Elizabeth's childless death. Though you're probably wondering what caused such an event that led to the execution of Mary. Well, let me take you back a few years. The Queen's problem started when the citizens of Scotland believed that she was behind the murder of her late husband, Lord Darnley. Darnley himself was not innocent. There was evidence that he may have been involved with the murder of an Italian merchant. Well, not may have been, he was involved. By the name of David Rizzio, who in turn may have had an affectionate relationship with the Queen. He was as well stabbed a little bit and... Um, by a little bit, I mean 57 times. It wasn't helped by the Queen marrying the Earl of Bothwell, who may have also had a hand in both Darnley and Rizzio's death. Notably, the last stab of Rizzio received was in person by Lord Darnley's dagger. Are any other regiment that's laying for a war? Come give to me the tartan of the gallon forty Lastly, we have to cover, well, the other people in the close. The House Mail's book, which told us so much about the character of Mary King, also unveils a picture about those who lived in the close. In the Grand Highs, or High Houses, which were tenements that stretched along the close, which could have been as tall as 16 storeys high, there lived many notable characters. Characters such as Thomas Patterstone, a lawyer, John Dinlop, a famous doctor, John Arnott, who gave 20,000 mercs, to a serious sum of money at the time, for individuals to be taught in the ways of religion, in the Leichhuses, or Low Hooses, there lived many poor people in extremely insanitary conditions, which also helped disease, but we'll cover that later. There lived people such as Patrick Byrne, a tanner who owned a house and a workshop in the close near the Nor Loch, which is what today's Princess Street Gardens are. His work, which cured animal hides and turned them into leather, would have stunk horrendously and polluted both the streets and the loch. Interestingly, there are no records of children living in the close, however we do know that they were present given the presence of Mary King's four children, all of which grew up in the close, and the remains of toys and bones which were crafted for, well, younger children and toddlers. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes part one of the story of Mary King's Close. We've covered the people and the background to the close, and next time we'll talk about war, pestilence and plague, and the adaptation into what the site is today. We're also going to cover some ghost stories, but nevertheless, I hope you enjoyed today's video, and if you enjoyed it, hit the like button. I apologise for my voice, I'm pretty sick at the moment, still, but uh, please subscribe, hit the bell icon, and uh, buy the new.